Welcome to the deep dive into Android IPC and specifically Binder Framework. Uh, my name is Alexander Garganta and what I um, plan on talking about is basically a couple of things. You know, why IPC matters and specifically on Android and how is Binder different than other forms of IPC and why is it well suited for essentially what we need on Android. Um, you're, you know, hopefully you're here because you're interested in Binder itself, but you may also be interested in how Android works. And Binder is basically one of those core pieces that glues everything together. Without Binder, literally the, the entire system would fall apart. So whether it's because, like I said, you want to take advantage of it and build your own custom apps and or low-level system services, or you just want to kind of get, get a sense of how it's all put together, this is what we plan on covering. My only concern is, and this is a little disclaimer right up front, is we only have about 50 minutes. This talk, when I originally put it together, I was aiming for two hours. So I'll have to condense quite a few things and skip over certain points and or even certain slides. Um, I know that's sometimes frustrating to do, but it's the only way I'm going to get through it. So um, we're going to talk about things like what Binder is, you know, IPC advantages, comparisons of Binder to other frameworks, um, Binder versus other forms of IPC that you might have used uh, if you were developing apps on Android, some of the terminology, how, how the Binder communicates and how the discovery works, um, a little bit about AIDL, um, the, essentially the reference mapping in, in Binder, which is one of the interesting pieces of it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about kind of how you would use Binder in a real application. Uh, we'll talk about asynchronous Binder and why it's important, uh, memory sharing and concerns around memory, Binder limitations, and a little bit about security. So, I'm, again, my name is Alexander Gargenta. I teach Android. Uh, I work for Maracana. We focus on Android, on open source training, and Android is a big part of it. I also run the San Francisco Android User Group as well as Java User Group, and involved with a bunch of other things related to Android. Um, Android is basically what I do most of the time these days. So, what is Binder? Binder is basically an IPC. Uh, framework, I like to call it framework because it's not just the binder, as you will see later on when we discuss the terminology, binders a lot of things. But you can think of it as a system for basically developing quote-unquote object-oriented OS. But the idea is we're not developing the OS itself to be object-oriented, which we could do, but rather we want to enable an operating system to behave as an operating object-oriented operating system. So rather than thinking of your OS as a bunch of you know, system calls, you think of your OS as a bunch of services that have states, that have behavior that you can invoke at any time. Kind of like microkernel to some degree, um, but basically something that can be bolted on to any operating system, like for example, Linux. So it is essential to Android. This diagram, I know it's kind of small, so let me zoom in a little bit. Uh, basically gives you an idea that, you know, pretty much all of the applications, all the system services, uh, a lot of the uh, essentially uh, underlying uh, framework infrastructure, middleware as we call it, all depend on Android um, binder, especially at the binder and the driver level. Um, in terms of binder itself, it comes from open binder. It was first uh, developed for BOS back in the day. Um, it was never really, never li really lived to see the day as part of BOS uh, because BOB was acquired by Palm. It was then ported to the Palm kernel, uh, first the COBOL, then later on the Linux kernel, and eventually um, was basically built into a full-fledged Palm OS and served its purpose, but that didn't really last too long because, as we know, you know Palm didn't really go as, as, as they hoped they did. So when, when um, HP acquired, I guess, later on WebOS, uh, Google acquired uh, Deanne Hagburn, and she was one of the key members of the B, uh, on the, the original B team uh, of Binder, and so along with her came kind of the knowledge of how to do IPC um, in, a, in a essentially embedded environment. So what is IPC and why do we care about IPC? So basically IPC is, can, be, can mean a lot of things, but ultimately it's used for message passing, synchronization, sharing memory, um, isolating certain key components of the system. Um, and of course, there's also something called RPC, uh, so remoting, but in Android, as you will see, when we talk about IPC, we do not assume any sort of remoting procedure calls. Um, it enables us to separate things. It provides privilege separation, data isolation, information sharing, and modularity. That's kind of one of the key components of it. Um, so 
when it comes to IPC, as you guys know, you know, being this is a Linux event, uh, there's many forms of IPC. You know, so we could be talking about files. We could talk. We could be talking about signals, sockets. Whether we're talking about Unix or TCP sockets, pipes, semaphores, shared memory. Um, you know, message passing frameworks like, for example, queues, message bus. Um, and then other forms of IPC like intents, content providers, messenger, right? And then there's the binder. So why binder? Why specifically, why do we need binder? Why is it so important? So um, again, this diagram on the right-hand side kind of gives, shows you the typical stack on Android. You guys have seen this probably many times. At the bottom, we have the kernel. At the top, we have the applications. And then in the middle, we have this middleware. Well, applications tend to be written in Java, and in order to take advantage of the application framework services, um, which run in separate processes, they actually consume them using IPC. Um, so this communication from applications down to application framework services is almost 99% done using binder framework. Um, go down from the application framework down into the la lower layers, we sometimes see the use of binders, sometimes we use Unix sockets, um, and sometimes we directly load the drivers through, you know, essentially JNI and a bunch of other uh, things like HALS. But that's beyond, beyond this talk. So in, in Android, Binder specifically provides us with security. So one of the features of it is that it enables us to run things in separate processes. And as a result of that, we get better security installation, um, i.e. sandboxing. Stability, so if things crash because they're running separate processes and because we have a good IPC framework in place, you know, they, they can be restarted without affecting other things in the system. Um, memory management, so one of the key features of Android memory management is this ability to be able to kill off applications that are no longer needed, um, either by activity manager service doing the job or in case it can't uh, cope with memory demands, having the low memory killer kick in. But for that to work, you need to be able to cleanly shut down the entire process. You cannot have applications share the underlying process essential infrastructure. So you need IPC to enable that process to, to be able to exist and be able to still coexist you know, with other processes in the system. Um, and then, like I said, even, um, even basically Android's uh, own components and apps all run in separate processes. So specifically, what, is, what does Binder essentially do for us? Um, it replaces all forms of IPC, or I should say System 5, traditional System 5-based IPC uh, on Android. So there's no support on Android for, so for Sys5, semaphores, shared segments, message queues, and whatnot. One of the main reasons for that is because Android's you know, essentially ability to kill out the processes without them having any sort of cleanup uh, action scheduled, uh, means that if you were to do, use traditional IPC, it may not work very well because you may essentially end up with resource leakage. Um, and you may have malicious code essentially you know, contribute to denial of service attacks. Um, Binder has a built-in IP um, reference counting mechanism, which enables it to count objects, if you will, that are shared across process boundaries. And when they're no longer needed, because say the, the process that was sharing them dies, those objects can be automatically essentially, well, the users of those objects can be notified and those references can be automatically reclaimed without having any sort of lingering resources be left in the system. Um, this is very key to essentially why Android Binder survives essentially this hostile environment with low memory killer where other IPC frameworks don't. Um, one of the other features of, of Binder compared to other forms of IPC is the so-called thread migration um, programming model. So the idea is with Binder, is you as the client of the binder framework, you basically make an invocation, a method invocation on, on an object that to you appears to be local. Um, but in reality, that object lives somewhere else. And what will happen is that your thread will, by default, block, and on the other side will continue running, if you will, that method invo invocation code. Of course, it's no longer your thread, it's somebody else's thread. But what's interesting is that to you, it appears like your thread just jumped on into another process and started executing within the you know, those, that process boundary. Um, so that's really key because it enables a very easy programming model to exist on Android. Um, we also have features like, for example, identifying senders of, uh, of requests. This is actually very key to Android security. Being able to know who's talking to whom at any time enables us to enforce permissions dynamically, and this is how most Android services do it. We also have unique object mapping across boundaries, um, process boundaries. So basically, if I share a service object, a binder object with another process, and that process shares that same object with yet another process, that reference to that object is unique across all processes 
on the system. And the kernel driver ensures of that. And this is actually key to how the discovery of bound services works on Android, as we will talk about in a moment. Um, we also have ability to send file descriptors across open process boundaries. So for example, if you want to play a media file in a media server, you're not sending the, the entire file over. You're sending just merely the file descriptor to that file to the other process. Underneath the hood, the file descriptors get duped and basically copied over to the other side. Um, Android also comes with something called AIDL, uh, which is basically interface definition language that allows services to describe their capabilities to clients. And moreover, Android comes with a tool called AIDL that can extract proxies and stubs, which do automatic marshalling and unmarshalling of data, as we will talk about in a moment. All of that you get for free, of course, only if you do it in Java. But nevertheless, the idea is you get you as a cons consumer of the binder framework have actually very little to do to take advantage of it. Um, you have a fairly uh, you know simplified transaction model. Sorry, I should I skip one. Um, you know, very simple support for marshalling and marshalling of common data types. Although custom types are also supported. Um, again, this auto generation of stubs and proxies is important. Um, the recursion across process boundaries is built in. So if a process A calls process B and process Process B calls back into process A that works out of the box. Um, and if your process A happens to be talking to a binder object, which is actually also inside a process A, um, so it's not IPC anymore, it's local, um, you are essentially skipping the entire overhead of marshalling and marshalling and invoking things locally. Um, it is not meant for RPC, it is uh, very much oriented towards cl you know, essentially client service. Uh, or message passing. It's not necessarily well suited for streaming um, and is not part of any sort of standard. So binder is not part of POSIX or anything like that. So there's, you know, in, in, in essentially it's API and implementation are one and the same. Um, as we will see, pretty much everything you do in Android depends on binder. Drawing, drawing on the screen depends on, Android, on binder. Uh, handling touch events depends on binder. Um, you know, playing stuff, you know, handling callbacks to your application depends on binder. You know, you sending intents, receiving intents and whatnot, that all depends on binder. So it's extremely important. Now, that said, a lot of Android low-level system services also take advantage of uh, the, the Unix domain sockets as a form of communication. So binder is not the only game in town, but it's the most common one. So, a lot of times when I talk about Binder, people ask, well, why, why do I need to know about Binder? Why don't I just use intents and content providers? And certainly you can. I'm not going to go into too much depth, but the idea is that in Android, if you have two applications that want to talk to each other, they can literally just have, for example, their activities open up each other via intents. Um, the activity that has it's been invoked can respond back with some result to the caller via another intent. Uh, you can also start services with intents. You can send intents as broadcast messages. You can receive them and whatnot. That also is IPC. This down below, which I'm going to kind of skip, um, is an example of how you could do that. I mean, many of you who have ever written Android applications have probably done something like this. But basically, you can have an application, create an intent, start another application with that intent. That intent contains, think of it as the parameters of that request. The other application can get that intent, handle the, get the data out of that intent, do some work on the behalf of the caller, create another intent, and basically send the result. And then the calling application gets the result and processes that. Um, it works and it's well suited. It's very, um, uh, there's, there's actually low coupling because these intents are not, um, are well defined. The data uh, parameters are well defined. But the problem is that this is all not really very OOP. It's asynchronous. It's not very well suited for situations where you want, you know, low latency. Um, and at the end of the day, all of this still underneath the hood uses binder. So, yes, intents are a form of communication between applications, and there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're just creating simple, trivial things. But if you want much more, essentially, you know, up to the millisecond notifications between or communication between multiple apps, and you don't want to depend on the asynchronous nature of, of intents, well, then you may want to go that, to that bottom level and take a look at Binder. Um, another thing that comes up a lot is Messenger. Um, IPC. Now, Messenger, I don't know how many of you know, is basically a mechanism that allows a remote process to use a messenger to call back to a local handler, uh, thereby passing you messages. Um, so basically, the idea is, let's say you had an application. It's probably best understood if I just de 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 you know, explain the code briefly. Um, let's say you have an application that wants to have some other service that do downloads of a bunch of images or something. What it could do is it create an intent. 
to put a bunch of URIs that it wants downloaded and then a messenger into that intent and send it over to the service. That service, on the other hand, we can get that intent, get the URIs from the, from the intent and start acting on those URIs, for example, say initiated downloads. But say wants to notify the original application of when every URI or every URL or I guess resource gets downloaded, what it could do is you can get, create a message and then essentially stick that message into the messenger or send it to, via the messenger to the other side. The other side essentially pass that messenger which was you know linked to a local handler that handler would just get a call back onto this handle message it would receive the message and then act on it so that is a form of IPC it's uh, well more much more it's much better you know to do it this way than to use frequent um, um, essentially intense sending a bunch of intents because that actually is not even an option so it this particular use case it's it's pretty good, but you know underneath the hood, this still uses binder. It's still asynchronous, um, and it's still not the most well you know the as as well suited for low latency because you still have to go through go through these handlers, which are essentially message queues. So before we talk about binder, how binder works, I just want to kind of briefly mention a few things about binder, just a terminology because. Binder means a lot of things. So um, first of all, there's the binder as a framework, which is essentially the overall IP, IPC ar architecture. It's not just the driver. There's libbinder. There's these proxies and stuffs and whatnot. A lot of these things essentially come into play when we when we talk about binder. So at the very low level, like at the very bottom right here, we have the binder driver. So that is what facilitates the actual communication or exchange of messages across process boundaries. Um, yes, I know this is a Linux conference. This is what we're most interested in. But then again, this alone would be useless had it not been for the rest of the, the infrastructure. Um, the protocol. So the protocol is just how we communicate with the binder dra driver and most of the time we're essentially sending it ioctals. The iBinder interface is essentially a simple interface that defines the, the, the basic mecha me mechanisms of every binder object. Binder objects are those things that we actually want to use. Those are the things that are, represent the services we want to interact with. So as you, will, as you will see later on, these iBinder objects have capabilities like, for example, telling us whether they're alive or we can go and subscribe to be notified when they die. So this is expressed using the default iBinder interface. AIDL is, I mentioned, a language that enables us to define business operations that go on top of the iBinder interface, and essentially that's what you know is what, what our clients are after. Without the you know the, the business operations was the point of using generic iBinder objects. Um, the actual binder object that is a basic implementation of that iBinder interface. It provides a very basic infrastructure, and that's what we end up extending from when it comes time to build building our own actual binder services. Binder tokens are basically, think of them as handles, think, or think of them as pointers, but they happen to be agnostic to the process they're in. So essentially, a binder object can be referenced via a token or a handle that is unique across an entire operating system. So essentially, it's a reference that, that ends up being unique and can be passed around. Binder service, that's what we are actually consuming. That's what we're interacting with. So for example, location, you know, a service is, is a binder service, or activity manager service, or power manager service, vibrator service, you know, surface flinger, sensor service, and so on and so on. These are all services that essentially implement binder. Um, binder client, that's what we use to essentially interact with the service. Um, the binder transaction, that's an essentially exchange of, if you will, data between the client and service through the binder driver. And the transactions are, as you will see, fairly simple. Uh, they involve just copy, copying data back and forth. A lot, of, a lot of what happens then is handled by the framework. Um, the binder parcel is basically a unit of data that, that, that essentially gets sent across process boundaries. Um, so when we send a message to the remote service, we're actually sending it in form of a parcel. So marshalling is a mechanism of converting our rich data types, i.e. a request that contains, for example, objects or data types that mean, have meaning to us, into a parcel. Unmarshalling is the reverse of that, taking a parcel that was received through a binder driver essentially and unmarshalling, converting it back into rich, say, Java or C++ or even C data types into something that we can work with. S proxies and stubs are the things that get auto-generated and essentially are the, are the things that enable automatic marshalling and unmarshalling 
If you, are, if you happen to be coding things in Java, in which case they are truly auto-generated. If you happen to be coding them in C++, then you have to go and write your own proxies and stuff. And finally, the context manager, that is the thing that enables the discovery of binder services. Because you know, having this remote pr process somewhere with these binder services available in it is useless unless we get a reference to them to begin with. And in Android, that context manager is called service manager and that's a daemon that most of you have probably seen if you've done PS. So let's take a look at kind of how this communication works. So at the end, at the, you know, what we ultimately want as the users of Binder is to have a client talk into a service. They, they just happen to be in different processes. That's kind of what we are after. But in reality, we cannot just go into another process and essentially invoke operations in another process because that would violate the process isolation. So we have to go through something that has ability to interact with both processes, and that's the kernel. So that's where the Binder driver comes into play. So how it typically works is that a service that wants to basically be uh, consumed by clients will come to the driver and register by essentially spawning off threads that will block on the binder driver in these blocking IOCTL calls, waiting for callbacks to do work. So that happens preemptively. So when a client wants to actually have service do some work on its behalf, it sends a message to the binder driver. The driver then finds the appropriate, essentially, service to, to service that message. The ser one of those service threads unblocks, handles that request, and essentially sends the, the, the response back to the binder driver via another one of those threads that, again, ends up blocking once the response is sent. The client at this point gets the message. What's interesting is that to client, this feels like an async, uh, sorry, a very synchronous communication channel. Uh, the services you will see, even though it has these threads, doesn't have to worry about them. All of that low-level thread management or thread pooling is automatically handled by the, 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 the I should say, framework. I'm not going to say the driver. So how does, the, how, do, how does this actually happen is that most of the time, um, what we see happening is these IOCTL calls for read-write calls, where basically a service will go to the binder driver and say, hey, I have some data for you of certain size, and then I, I, I want to get some data back of, or up to certain size, or I should say, you know, it'll basically get, initiate this, this structure into which later on the, 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 the data will be populated. So basically what happens is the service comes to the bind, bind the driver for the first time, the write buffer is empty, just going to sit there, the, 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 and then the service then blocks. When the client comes later on and sends a request to the service, the binder driver takes the request, copies it into basically the buffer that the service is going to then read from, and then tells how much data is in the buffer, and then at that point unblocks the service. Now, now the service has some data. When it produces a result, it goes and basically takes the result, writes it into, again, one of these buffers, into this write buffer, and basically gives, go, goes and gives it back to the, 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 the binder driver. And so essentially, this happens on both the service side and the client side. We're just exchanging these buffers back and forth. What's in the buffers is something we'll talk about in a moment, but basically, it's the, it are the parcels plus the handles to who we want to talk to. Now, um, there's... In these buffers, I guess I should also say there's, there's these bookkeeping commands that basically tells us, like, for example, is the service still alive? Is this, you know, if you wanted to ping something and whatnot. We'll talk again about this in a little bit. I have to speed up because we're going to run out of time. Um, however, one thing I wanted to mention is that most of the time, all of this communication that I just mentioned is IOCTLs. It's very low level. We actually don't want to know anything about it. As the consumers of this framework, we just want to basically send messages back and forth and, and act on messages. So that that's where the proxies and stops come into play. So the proxy's job is to basically take this very high level, say Java or C++ request, you know, receive it, and then convert it into one of those parcels, and then submit an IOCTL transaction to the binder driver and block. On the other hand, the stubs job is to basically listen, if you will, um, to the binder driver callback, and then upon receiving the callback, demarshal or unmarshal that parcel into something that the service can understand and then call the appropriate callback method in the service. The service is coded so that it only knows about these high level method calls, for example, you know, to do something that involves rich Java objects. So it doesn't know anything about the infrastructure. Except for the fact that the service has to extend from this binder object and implement this binder interface, the rest of the implementation of the service is in no way you know, tied to binder framework. It doesn't care about it. 
The only other thing, the semantical thing that affects it is threading because every time a service gets called, it, the, the invocation of the service method can happen in any one of these threads that was basically preemptively, you know, over here uh, tied to the binder driver. So except for the multi-threaded behavior and the fact that you have to extend from a particular class, the rest of the, the, the infrastructure is completely seamless. Now, one more thing I want to mention before we, actually two more things before we move off of this slide. One is, um, to clients, I, you guys, you guys, you know, so let's say you guys as application developers, not as system integrators. Um, even this is way too much knowledge for you. You guys, as a bell application developers, don't even want to know anything about binder, about proxies, about stubs. You just want to basically consume some service. So what Android does, for example, for system services, let's say locations manager service, activity manager service, power manager service, and you name it, there's like 60 of them plus. What they do is they provide these so-called managers, so these things. A manager's job is basically to be a proxy to a proxy, if you will. So manager facilitates the discovery of the service you want to talk to, and he hides the binder interaction away from you. So, for example, when you're talking to a location manager, you are actually talking to a local Java object, which underneath the hood, if you were to open it up and, and take a look at it, will convert your method calls into remote binder method calls via proxy. And the reason why it, the manager is there is to handle certain things like you know, exceptions, like for example, let's say you get a remoting exception if the, the remote thing dies, as well as to handle lookup mechanisms, as well as to handle some threading issues. For example, if you're getting asynchronous callbacks, the manager's job is to take those asynchronous callbacks and convert them into something you can handle on the UI thread. Otherwise, you, you have these thread, you know, thread issues, potentially. So, for those of you who've done Android develop, application development, you've been using Binder all along, you just haven't necessarily noticed them because you've most likely just been using these managers. The last part is the discovery. How do you actually find the thing you want to talk to, you know, to begin with? Well, when it comes to Android's built-in services, basically what we need is this thing called Context Manager. So, if any of you have done, you know, PS on an Android, you know, ADB shell, you would have seen something called Service Manager. That is the Context Manager, another name for it. So what the Context Manager does very early, it's actually one of those daemons that gets launched very early by init. Um, it goes to the binder driver and says, hey, binder driver, I want to be your Context Manager. And the binder driver only allows one Context Manager at a time to be registered with it. Then what it does, it submits, essentially creates a, you know, bunch of threads and waits on the binder driver. It itself is a service. A context manager, aka service manager, is a service, a binder service. So what is its job? Its job is basically to sit there and allow other services to register themselves with the context manager. So for example, when you have a location service, the location service will re be registered with the context manager as the location, quote, quote, unquote, location service. So when a client needs to find location service, all he needs to do is ask the context manager. So how does that work? Well, basically, the service well, at some point will register with the binder driver. The service will then use a service manager or context manager proxy, because now the service is the client to the context manager. Then the service, this proxy is going to go to binder driver, figure out where the context manager is, get a handle to the context manager, and then submit a request to context manager and say, hey, I want to register myself with you. On the other side, when the client wants to look up a service to talk to, the client submits a request again via another one of these service manager proxies, submits a request, and via the request basically gets a reference to the service manager. Once it has a service manager, it asks where's the location service, for example, and it gets a reference back to it. And now the client can go and use it the way we talked about before. So if you were to do ADB shell service list, you will see the list of a bunch of these services. So this is essentially, for example, the name of a service. So all these services are registered by simple string-based names. And then this is the you know, AIDL that it implements, basically, or the name of the AIDL that it implements, say, for example, for location. But there's you know, 70 plus services you will find here. Um, this diagram kind of shows you another, another way of picturing all of this communication. Um, let me see if I can quickly take you through it. It's somewhat redundant, but I don't know if it's probably somewhat easier to, to grasp. So let's say, for example, you had a service that you wanted to expose to clients. How, how would that work? Um, and let's picture that service being part of the service manager. 
right, which is another daemon that we know exists in Android. So at the very beginning, and this is kind of starting with a negative, you know, this service is going to run from a main, and it will basically start a pool of threads that will then go to binder, so this is step minus three, and essentially block. They will just sit there, block, waiting for requests. So they will issue those blocking IOCL calls. At that point, the service will have a, presumably another thread, and that thread will then do a lookup of the service manager, which we talked about, and it will then register the service with the service manager or context manager. Again, the two names can be used interchangeably. So now the client runs. The client wants to use the service, right? How the client goes to the service manager, I, I didn't put in this diagram just because it's, again, it would involve a, a lot more errors. But basically, the client ultimately, over here, wants to invoke an operation on the service. That's what it wants to do. Invoke some service for some method foo and for, you know, pass some data, let's call it some bar. I don't know what that is. Um, so this client will basically invoke what it, what it thinks, you know, is a, a service reference and invoke a method foo for some bar. But what a client doesn't know or care, this is actually what's important, is that it's actually talking to a proxy, not a remote object, right? Client is actually has a reference to a local object. That proxy will convert that request from, you know, some foo that, you know, essentially method call foo to a transaction called foo, whoops, and into that transaction, it will, along with the transaction, will basically invoke the transaction with these parcels. These parcels will be auto-created by the proxy, and into the parcels will take the sum bar, so we'll take the sum bar, and we'll basically shove it inside of this data parcel, and then we'll invoke some transaction. That transaction goes via libbinder through a blocking IOCL call to the driver, over here to the binder driver. The binder driver now realizes that this transaction is referencing essentially the service because the service previously registered itself with it. And basically, it wakes up one of those threads that was previously blocked on the binder from the service side. That thread takes the parcel that, that was basically received now through the binder driver, unmarshals it, or I should say gives it to a stub. The stub unmarshals it, figures out that the client wants to invoke a transaction called you know, foo, and it actually invokes a method on the service called foo with that same bar. So the, this bar, you know, I call it some bar, basically got recreated on an, in another process. It went through a marshalling stage, then into essentially copy, gets copied across the process boundaries via, via the binder driver, and then on the other side gets recreated into its original state. Again, the marshalling is built in for a lot of the common data types, but you can create and roll out your own marshalling and unmarshalling strategies. Finally, the service now invokes the operation the client requested, which was the, say, the full operation, and produces some result. The client, re or sorry, I should say, the service returns that result. The result now goes back to the stub, and via the stub gets remarshaled into now the reply parcel, so it gets converted from a sum result, which can be, say, some Java data type, into essentially a, a series of bytes. And then via libbinder, submits, gets submitted back to the binder driver, right? This is, again, another, another one of those blocking calls. On the other side, we unblock because the client had been waiting all this time. The proxy receives the, summary, the, the reply parcel. The proxy, the proxy unmarshals the reply object from the reply parcel and it gives back that reply object or some result back to the client. So the same some result that got created here and returned is the very same object but now reconstructed in another process. Okay? That's roughly how things work. Now this is kind of a diagram I showed a couple of years ago, actually, on when I talked about services in Android. This is just, a, it gives you an idea of what, let's say, a location stack on Android looks like. I'm not going to go over the entire detail, but I just want to point out, let's say you have wanted to consume a location service, right? What you would do is you would ask the system for a system service called location. What you would get is actually a location manager. So what the location manager would implicitly do is do a call to the service manager, which is down here, to basically figure out where is the location service. Where is the location service? Location service was cre created earlier on inside of the system server and got registered with the service manager via this term called location. So here, when the client actually says, I want to say get last known coordinates, what it's doing is it's talking to this, but in reality, this is first looking up 
the service and it is then going through a proxy via the binder driver into this stub and via the stub basically into a service and then from the service it goes and talks to these location providers which themselves are services and they talk to house and drivers and whatnot. That's besides the point. But basically the binder is key to this jumping from an application space to essentially this middleware space which itself is just another process. Again, I wish I had more time to go over more details, but you know, I have to speed up. So um, what is AIDL? So AIDL basically is the language for describing the services to their clients. It looks and feels like Java. It's not Java. It's similar though. Um, this is an example of an AIDL basically, um, you know, service. Call it some foo service. Generally, we would call this, save this file into a .aidl file with a name that matches the name of the service. You will notice that this feels like namespace because it is. It's same like Java. Notice we have this use of imports. And now our, we define our interface. In this interface, we just define the business methods that the service is supposed to implement and not supposed to, has to implement, and that the client has to, you know, can consume. These methods are just prototypes. Um, they look and feel like Java. So you, you define the return type, then you define the name, method name, and you define one or more, or zero or more parameters. What's different is that unlike Java, you can also specify this essentially um, flag that determines which way is the data copied. For example, if you say in, let's say you're deleting some something of type bar, that means that the data is copied from the client to the service, but if the service were to make some changes to bar, let's say bar was immutable, those changes would not be visible on the client side. Um, versus over here, let's say you had this object bar that you wanted to have the service save, and maybe the service updates the ID of bar when it gets saved, whatever bar may be. That basically, you know, now in out, <coughs> excuse me, means the data gets copied both ways. So. Um, what happens when you create a file like this? Um, Eclipse, if you're doing this in Eclipse or if you're using the Android build system, will automatically employ this tool called AIDL, which is part of the SDK, which will generate in the gen folder this essentially ifu service, which is the same as the name of the service that I, of the file we created, which implements essentially this interface or extends this i interface, and inside of it defines the stub and then the proxy. The stub basically has this on transact method. That is how the service is going to receive transactions. And the proxy, on the other hand, has the actual methods the clients are going to use. And notice that what the, those methods do is they create these parcels, convert somehow you know, our data types, for example, this bar, into a parcel. So somehow they ask the bar to write itself into a parcel. And then the, the stub, or sorry, the proxy submits these transactions. You know, there, yes, there's more that we, you know, we can go much deeper than this, but that's basically underneath the hood what's happening. Um, and then here's the definition of all the methods now written in Java. Um, if you were to do this in C++, you, you end, up, end up having to basically write a lot of this code yourself. So I'm not going to go into the details of how that will be done right now. So um, AIDL out of the box, or binder out of the box framework, supports all of these data types, especially in the Java land. So, you know, all the primitives, including primitive arrays, character sequences and strings, of course, file descriptors, which I said get copied as a file descriptor, um, serializable objects, which can get converted to bytes, but Java serialization is not the most op optimal thing in the world and should be avoided. Uh, maps and lists. So basically, if you have you know, objects that are structured into maps or lists, that will be automatically marshaled and are marshaled. Bundles, which are just specialized versions of maps. Um, object arrays, sparse arrays, and you know, sparse Boolean arrays these are just more specialized. And then iBinder. So these are the interesting ones. So anything you pass to the other side as iBinder gets passed as a reference and not as a copy. So basically everything else gets copied, including the file descriptor gets copied, but iBinder essentially gets passed as a reference, which is how the client can, for example, submit a listener to the service so the service can notify the client of changes of some state via callbacks. So in that case, the roles change. The client, when it sends something that's of type iBinder, it's essentially becoming a service. So the client becomes a service, and the service that invokes that callback functionality becomes the client to the original client. So 
However, what if you had your own data type, something that you, know, you could not basically, you know, doesn't match one of these. So what you would do is you could then create your own custom data class. You would just, in that class, may have you know, internally data structures of whatever, so you can have whatever you want it in there. But the key to making it work with Binder is to implement what's known as parcelable. Parcelable is an interface that requires you to basically create a strategy for writing a fixed strategy for writing basically your object into a parcel, right? And that means boil it down to the primitives that are supported, as well as a mechanism for converting a parcel back into that object. So for example, if you're sending bar to the service, the proxy will call this method to convert your bar into a parcel. And when the, the service receives this parcel, it will enact, the stub will call this method to convert that parcel back into the original bar. So as long as the, 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 the two mechanisms match, that will work out of the box. Um, I'm not going to go into more details than that. You can basically, you know, primitive, you know, primitive values don't require, for example, directional flag and whatnot. Comments get copied and so on and so on. That's beside the point. You can read it on your own. Let me just mention this briefly. Um, Binder basically is, um, um, uh, you know, supports these references, like I said, that, that can cross object boundaries and somehow remain unique. This is key because, for example, if a service were to register itself with a service manager, let's say a location service registers itself with the service manager, what, and now the client asks for that handle, well, in, that handle needs to work in the client just like it did in the service manager, right? So these handles need to be able to be shared. So what happens is that when you're creating these binder objects, the kernel that binder doesn't know anything, the kernel binder driver doesn't know anything about them because you know they're just local binder object. But whenever you send a binder object across essentially the process boundary, i.e., through the kernel driver, the kernel driver notices that that's a binder object and re essentially creates an internal mapping that remembers that that object points to your process, and it then creates a handle that it sends to the other side. If the other side ever references that handle, well, actually, the other side now gets essentially that pseudo handle. But on the other side, you need a local binder object. You need a local object that represents the remote object. So there's a local reference to what is essentially you know, your object. So that local reference essentially gets to some arbitrary, you know, not arbitrary, but some sort of a pointer, if you will, in your own local, local memory space. But whenever you then later on invoke an operation where you're writing that memory address, to the kernel driver, i.e. you're referencing that, essentially the kernel rewrites that local pointer back to that kind of generic pointer, if you will, or the handle, and then maps it to what actual process is supposed to have that. So there's basically state that is inside of the kernel driver that does the mapping of local pointers to these global, if you will, pointers. And along with that, it does re uh, reference counting so that it knows how many times a particular object is being used because it knows, it knows who you know, it gave it to. So this is key because this way we can discover when something, for example, dies or if something is no longer needed, the kernel driver can auto automatically tell the service that is no longer needed. So for example, service can take it out of service. So I'm not going to go into more details on that. Again, we're just running out of time. Um, so let me just briefly mention that there is an example here that, that I invite you to take a look at, where basically I have a little application called Fibonacci that has a simple UI that looks like this. You punch in some number. You select which Fibonacci algorithm you want to use, whether it's going to be implemented in Java or C, and whether it's going to be implemented recursively or, or iteratively. And you click on this button. And that button basically is supposed to return the result of that Fibonacci calculation. What's interesting is that the actual implementation of this Fibonacci algorithms it happens inside of this service, whereas the UI lives inside of the client. Right. So um, let me just briefly mention kind of how things work. So. This is, again, coming to the application space. So if you're writing applications, you'll really quickly realize that the services and clients that use Binder directly are going to have to depend on a common interface. So when you're you know, forced to deal with shared code, one of the ways to, deal, to, to do that in Android, well, you know, essentially, so you're not duplicating code, is to create a library project. If you don't know what that means, you'll look it up. But basically, what I do here is I Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go into that. It's essentially, it's a project that itself is deployable, but it can be referenced by other projects and any art artifacts of a library project get incorporated into your project at the build time, okay? 
So for example, let's say I had a, wanted to define a common interface and common data types, right? So, so these are the types that are referenced by the client and service. Um, what I would do is I would create a common project. I would make it a library project. And inside of the project, I would then define my AIDL interface. And I would call, create a file called I Fibonacci service dot AIDL. Inside of, it, I, inside of it, I would define the business operations. And then basically, uh, you know, that will be the first step. Um, unfortunately, this uses custom data types. So this will actually not generate anything yet until I do something else. So I need to define those custom data types. So those custom data types, in this case, I have a re object called, or class called Fibonacci request, whose job is to basically encode the N, which is what you want to do Fibonacci on, as well as the type of the algorithm you want to use it, do it on. And in this case, that's just a simple enum. Well, because this is a custom data type, I can't just put it in a parcel because parcel doesn't know anything about Fibonacci request. So in order for this to play well with a framework, what I need to do is implement parcelable. So how do I do that? I just add the implements parcelable, which forces me to basically write this method, which given some parcel, I can convert my object into that parcel, which essentially means I'm just boiling it down to its primitives. Notice that enums, all I need to do is get its ordinal value, and basically I write it as a simple int. On the flip side, I basically need to recreate this object from a parcel in order to basically deploy it again. So I'm not going to go into, uh, there's basically the, the Fibonacci response, which is kind of similar. I'm not going to go over it. It's not important. It's basically just has, you know, two longs, not, not nothing, but same, same idea. So I mean, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, essentially move forward. Um, so basically, when this is, Got it. Um, when you now grow, created this, this AIDL file, you now want to create a service. So how does that work? Well, if this AIDL file was well you know, written, um, the tool AIDL will automatically run by, be run by Eclipse and generate this stub and proxy. So what you do is you now create a new, you know, so let's say a service project. That service project extends the stub. By extending a stub, you're basically, essentially, you are a binder object, and that forces you to automatically implement all of those interface methods that the, the, the stub essentially defined. So these are the methods that I had, like, for example, you know, fib, you know, just a bunch of fib methods. These are the business methods. It's not important. So the implementation of the, these, as you can see, it's rather simple. You're just, you know, in this case, as long as you don't care about this part, this part up here, the rest of this implementation is pure Java, and that's one of the key benefits to bind there. You don't have some sort of a loop. You're not pulling on some file descriptor. You're just writing callback methods. And what will happen is when a client submits a method, an auto, a thread will be automatically picked from this thread pool, and one of those threads will invoke one of these callback methods. You just have to essentially do the work, and so it makes the service extremely easy to write. So, of course, you have to worry about protecting some shared state, if there is any, because there could be multiple concurrent requests happening at the same time. So, in terms of the clients, um, I should, uh, this part I'm going to skip. This has to do with how you expose the service to the clients. It really depends on whether you're writing an application or whether you're writing, essentially, a um, 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 you know, system service. With a system service, all you need to do is construct this object that we previously created this thing, and you just go and say, service manager, would you be so kind to remember this? But service manager will not do that for user services because for security reasons. And so you end up having to essentially find another way of exposing it, which this talks about. And again, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. I just want to mention for the client part, the client basically how he uses the service so this just talks about the client. This is the whole UI. You can literally go through all of this. And by the way, all this code is on UI, on, on GitHub. But the client basically just has a reference to the service by an interface. Um, but in order for the client to connect to it, it needs to get somehow the reference to the remote service. This is how it gets it, as an iBinder object. But the client then can't use the iBinder object because it's way too generic. So what the client needs is to convert that object into a proxy. And this is the one line that basically does that for you. This is auto-generated code. Behind the scenes, this will generate a proxy and give it to the client. And then when, the client, when it comes time for the client to use it, this is basically all it takes. Um, the client says service.fib. That's it. It submits a request, and it gets a response. It doesn't know anything about binder at that point. The only thing that makes this binder specific is the fact that this can fail with the remote exception. That's basically if the service gets, gets you know, killed in the, in, the mean, in the meantime. 
So I'm not going to go into details of that. I also want to invite you to take a look at the asynchronous binder, which in this case, basically what's different is that by adding this one-way keyword, for example, onto your AIDL interface, what you're saying to the binder framework is that the client should not block for the service to do the work. So the client submits a certain request and goes back to what it was doing. So now how does the client get back the, re the response? In this case, the client has a listener that it sends to the service. What happens is this listener gets passed as a reference and the client gets, gets basically the, the data back that way. So there's some threading issues that you have to worry about on the client side when you're using listeners because the callbacks happen on binder threads. And if you were to try to update the UI from a binder thread, you would basically get one of those exceptions. So there's, you know, then you have to use handlers and whatnot. That's where, for example, Messenger makes this easy for you. So I'm not going to go into the details of it because, again, we're out of time. I want to mention for sharing memory, Binder has a limit as to how much data you can pass back and forth, and that limit is one meg. If you want to share memory, one way to do it is to use Ashman. So what you do is you basically create an Ashman region of certain size, you put your data into that region, and then you send the file descriptor to that region to the other side if they want to get access to it. Again, I'm not going to go into details. You can read it on your own. Um, other limitations, Binder has a limit up to 15 concurrent threads on the, on, in each process. So that means that you basically can up to 15 things happening through the Binder framework for a given process. So for example, if the service happens to be doing some blocking work, right? So it's better not to do it in a binder thread, but rather spawn its own thread to do that blocking work and allow the binder thread to go back to the pool and service some other requests, especially if that was written to be asynchronous, asynchronous to begin with. In terms of security, I'm just going to mention that there can only be one service manager uh, at any given time for security reasons, and that one service manager by default does not allow untrusted services to bind with it, the, which is why when you're writing application level services, you end up having to go to this kind of roundabout way of binding it. This just talks about how this is done. And finally, I, I want to mention that one of the key features of Binder is that it sends the information about the client to the service on every request which is then used by services to figure out who the clients are and then based on that information, figure out whether those clients should be authorized to make access or, or essentially invoke those operations. So almost all of the if, uh, framework services in Android are enforced this way. Although, like for example, let's say vibrate, let's say you wanted to vibrate a device. Well, before the vibrate happens, the very first thing that happens is it checks for whether the caller has the permission to vibrate the device. And if the permission isn't granted, you get an exception. Or for example, if you're talking to location service, if you don't have the location to access find location, so if you don't have permission to access find location, you get an exception. How does this work? Well, underneath the hood, we just ask Binder, who are you? You're talking to us. Once we know who you are by your UID, we can go to figure out which application you are. Once we know which application you are, we can ask the package manager which permissions have, you, have been granted to you. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mechanism that basically gets used for almost all permission enforcement on Android. Um, the rest of the, the, actually only two more slides, I think we're done. Um, one other feature of Binder is this death notification, which is very important. So for example, let's say you go and ask a uh, location service to get you updates every time location changes, and then you die because you get low memory killed or you have some, something happens in your process and you forget to unregister. Well, guess what? We don't want to have the GPS be, you know, polling and sending these updates to nobody, right? Or if you ask for a wake lock and you never return it and you die, we don't want this wake lock to keep the device awake. So what happens is these services basically track the clients basically through Binder, and they get notified when the clients die, and they automatically do cleanup on the client side when that is detected. They, there's these so-called, you'll see, you can link to death of any binder object, and then once you basically get notified as a death recipient, you can, for example, you know, remove you know, that object from, for example, you know, being updated or something else. Like, you know, you can shut down whatever you were doing on, the, on behalf of that object. It's actually very key to how Android manages resources. Had it not been for this, we'd be really hard for Android to basically avoid these sort of, sort of you know, essentially bad applications, you know, creating denial of service uh, things. And then finally, 
reporting binder has a call you know on through the proc file system uh, or through the to the debug file system basically reports on these transactions which I wish I had time to show you but you can kind of try it on your on your own and see what happens um, there's a whole bunch of other resources I invite you to check out um, you know a lot of uh, you know good slides and and, and essentially uh, discussion of Android or of binder and open binder that's that's worth looking at and so Again, in summary, we took a look at what Binder is, how it compares to others, briefly how it works. Um, you know, I briefly talked about how you could implement it. I invite you to take a look at the code. Uh, we talked about features like AIDL, the security, um, debt notification, and so on and so on. Um, uh, this record, this talk will be recorded, or actually is being recorded. I'll save it and later on upload it to the same URL. I invite you to check it out, and hopefully you guys got something out of it. So thank you. I'll be here if you have any questions.